And so the next talk is by Sebastian Ulrich and Leonardo de Mora. It's called Beyond Notations, Hygienic Macro Expansion for Theorem Proving Languages. Uh, and once again, uh, I'm supposed to um, uh, broadcast it. It's pre-recorded. So let me, let me see if I can uh, get that going. OK, thanks for having me. Um, so this talk is about how we brought hygienic macro expansion to the Lean4 theorem prover, and also how and why you might want to do the same for your own ITP. First of all, I have to say this has been a long time coming, and I'm very glad it finally landed. So three years ago, Leonardo de Moura, my uh, co-author and main developer of Lean, opened this issue about refactoring our parser and also implementing hygienic macros. So after some um, very helpful early comments also by David Christensen and Gabriel Ebner, thank you to the both of you for that, um, we decided to um, implement this and that's where the actual feature creep started. So we said, well, if we change the parser, we also have to adapt the um, elaborator probably. And at that point, we might also want to implement some other plans we had for it. Okay, at this point, um, we are basically rewriting the whole front end of Lean. So um, we probably shouldn't do that in C++. Um, we should do it in Lean so that finally users can actually access all these internals. Okay, so let's rewrite Lean in Lean. Um, but yeah, we, we first, first need a compiler for actually doing that because the interpreter will not cut it. And um, at this point we said, okay, we really want to do this, but this will be a multi-year project. And so let's stop working on Lean 3 and simply call this one Lean 4. So that's what we've been working on for the last few years. Not all the parts are quite finished yet, so there has been no official release of Lean 4 so far, so it may not be too far off, but at least all the parts I want to talk about today are basically done. So what are these issues um, that we want to solve with macros and that led to this whole effort? In Lean 3 and similar ITPs, you have this uh, notion of um, mix-fix notations, at least, um, for introducing syntax sugars. So for example, we can say if we have terms um, separated by these tokens, then we will translate that to the right-hand side term. But that is already a fundamental limitation that it only works for terms. We cannot, for example, write a notation that expands to a lemma, say, generates a backward and forward lemma from an if and only if proof. And similar restrictions are usually true for inputs. So maybe we can even um, abstract over binders as well, but then there's probably some pretty specific restrictions on how we can use them so that the notation is still well behaved or in other words, hygienic. So in Lean 3, we actually have this uh, pretty arcane uh, syntax for expressing these restrictions, which no user should ever have to uh, memorize. I have to say here, at least that in Coq, they have a much nicer syntax for this, for still with restrictions. And with uh, the fundamental restriction, again, that you cannot abstract over arbitrary syntax kinds. So when the mathematical components library in Coq, for example, defines um, big operators like um, summation and multiplication, they actually have to um, repeat the translation rules for all the ways you can write down indices in these um, operators for every single operator because they cannot abstract over that. And finally, you may be in luck and your system actually has a much lower level below notations where these restrictions don't apply, but usually that is a completely different system, maybe even in a different language, and it will usually not come with any hygiene guarantees. Instead, in Lean4, we're introducing a unified system for all these abstraction levels based on hygienic macro expansion. 
So we still have notations as simple term-to-term -term transformations and in fact they can still um, abstract over binders simply because syntactically these are actually subsets of terms. And semantics are now only uh, ascribed after expansion so the notation command actually does not care anymore what is and isn't a binder. So um, below notations we have channel macros which are arbitrary surface syntax to surface syntax transformations. So if we look at our notation as a macro we see that the syntactic categories of the inputs and the output are now explicit and as well on the right hand side it is now explicit what is a syntax quotation and what are placeholders inside this quotation because the right hand side can now actually be an arbitrary computation that returns a surface syntax tree. And below macros we actually have one more level which we call elaborators. So these are surface syntax to core syntax transformations that is into the language of the kernel. And on this level um, the benefit is that we can actually do type directed translation as we'll see later. But uh, for a very uh, simple example, if we just want to turn a macro into an elaborator, as seen here, we can simply take the syntax generated by the macro and elaborate it recursively, for example, by passing it to the elab term function in the case of terms. And all of these levels, as I said, are um, powered by hygiene guarantees. So at this, uh, at this point I should probably talk a bit more about hygiene in detail. So I've already said that for notations hygiene basically means they are well behaved. So we have a notation here um, that uh, accepts a single term E and wraps it in a lambda. And um, intuitively we expect that even if E contains some X from some context, this has nothing to do with this X we're introducing here. So this should always be the constant function and there should be no capturing between X and E. And this capture avoidance is exactly what hygiene means. Um, and that works just uh, as well for general macros. So if we take a look at the elab command, which is actually a macro itself, uh, we see that yeah, it is not primitive, but actually returns a new syntax quotation um, with a general lean function that is simply tagged with an attribute. And the name of this lean function actually does not matter at all. So in the actual implementation, we simply call it elab fn. And we can do that exactly because of hygiene. So hygiene guarantees that even if we call the elab command twice, we will get two elab fn uh, functions out of it that do not collide with each other because they cannot capture it from outside the macro. So um, all in all, we can say that hygienic macros really mean that they're when they are expanded, they're introducing a fresh scope for all the identifiers inside introduced by this macro. And that is of course not a novel idea by us. Um, macro expansion has long been researched in the Lisp community and our main inspiration for our approach is the new record expander uh, as described in the paper binding as sets of scopes. I won't explain the um, original algorithm here because we did actually apply quite a few changes to it but of course we discuss it in the related work of our paper. Um, so what we did to the algorithm is we um, drastically simplified it for yeah, a slightly simpler macro system that we want um, compared to records. So we're not supposing some uh, features like local macros or mutual recursion between declarations and macros um, that we did not deem mandatory and that actually make the um, set of scopes approach much more complicated.
So in our simplified system, we can really uh, um, describe the approach in on two slides. So first of all, um, when we have a syntax quotation, when we elaborate, we re remember the names of the surrounding scope that match identifiers inside the syntax quotation. So in this example, I've um, noted these annotations using curly braces. So we see the identifiers elabfn and stx do not match anything out in the outside scope. But for syntax, we do seem to have a matching declaration from some namespace. So we remember the full name of this, that declaration, lean.syntax, inside these curly braces, inside the syntax tree. And then the second step is that when we execute the syntax quotation, when we have evaluate it, we tag names introduced by this quotation. And by the uh, eventual macro. So when we um, run the example from above, we may get something like, oh, now all the identifiers from inside the syntax quotation are suffixed with a dot trendy three. And we might indeed um, accumulate uh, sequences of these tags, which, is, uh, which can happen when you have macros that are generating macros. Um, this may sound esoteric at first, but yeah, this is actually what, um, true for the um, notation and macro and elab commands um, I've talked about before. These are all macros generating other macros or elaborators. And um, in contrast to the first step, we're actually saving these tags as part of the actual lean name of the identifier. So stx.23 is, is a valid through internal lean name um, already since lean3. And I believe um, other ITPs also have um, such representations for internal names. So we can simply reuse that. Why we make this distinction between the two steps should be clear in a moment. And I should also mention that um, these two steps, they are actually not some primitives in the whole elaboration system, but they are implemented inside the syntax quotations, which are simply another kind of macro. And the code generated from the syntax quotations implements this whole um, behavior. Okay, so with that, we've um, remembered all the scoping necessary for implementing hygiene. Now, of course, we still have to make use of that. So um, for that, we adapt our name resolution procedure slightly. So step one, when we see a use of, a, um, of an identifier such as sdx.23 here on the right hand side, we check the local context together with all the tags on that, names, uh, on that name. And then if, if it matches something in the local context, we reference that declaration. So in this example, we see there is a parameter here with exactly the same name and the same tags. Um, so this will reference uh, this parameter. And um, yeah, because we use, we make the tags part of the actual name of the identifier, this step is actually completely unchanged from lean3, from basic name resolution. We simply check, is this name in the local scope? If yes, use it. And that is the reason why we uh, store names inside the identifier um, itself. And then there is the second step. Um, if local um, check didn't work, we check the global context instead. And at this point, we also check the remembered names if we have any of them. So in the uh, case of uh, the syntax reference, uh, we probably don't have syntax.23 itself in the global context, except if the same macro actually introduced this declaration. But we do still have our remembered name, lean.syntax. So at this point, we will um, use that and um, reference lean.syntax for this variable reference. And yeah, 
As a third step, if neither local or global check worked, then we simply fail as usual. So in summary, um, the whole for hygiene, the only data structure we actually had to change is the surface syntax tree for remembering these names. And the tags are uh, actually part of the, uh, of the name itself. And this was a very important aspect for us because it means that hygiene does not um, yeah, infect other parts uh, that we for, uh, like the local context or the global context data structures that we, we use in many other parts of the system. And so the system is still kept simple. And of course, it should also be simpler to adapt this approach for other systems. So you should now have an idea of how our um, hygiene system works and how hard or simple it is to implement. Um, but for now, let's look at some actual examples. So probably the most important and nicest example is the Lean Elaborator itself, which is now completely modular. So every syntactic form in Lean is defined as its own macro or elaborator. For example, after defining the syntax of the if then else form, we have two macro rules that translate the dependent and non-dependent um, syntax of the if to the appropriate function. Um, yeah, so with macro rules, we can actually give multiple um, translations defined by multiple patterns. And as you might guess at this point, the macro command we've seen before is simply another shorthand for a syntax and a single macro rule definition. Um, for a slightly more interesting um, example, perhaps let's look at the anonymous constructor, which is a term that uh, under these big angle brackets is um, enclosing a sequence of terms. And the semantics of that is if we want to get formal, something like, okay, if we have a um, anonymous constructor, of um, sequences of a sequence of terms t and the expected type is uh, tau, then if tau is uh, actually an inductive type um, i and i has a single constructor c, then the whole thing is actually equivalent to elaborating the constructor of i applied to the arguments inside the anonymous constructor. So, okay, let's try to implement that in E4. So we start with the lab uh, command and define the syntax of the anonymous constructor. And after that, we capture, after this left arrow, we capture the expected type in the variable tau. And after the right hand arrow, we give our implementation as usual. So the first thing we do is we uh, reduce tau to its recat normal form, and then we check its function head um, if it's a constant i. After that, we get the constructors of i and check if there is a single constructor c. And finally, we assemble a new syntax tree from this information and recursively elaborate that. So, um, yeah, nothing too fancy going on here, but we are actually using type-directed translation. And I should point out this make C term it function we're using in the syntax quotation, that's actually a hygiene bending function. So meaning this is actually manipulating hygiene information um, directly. More specifically, what it's doing is, um, it's creating a syntax identifier with the remembered name C, so that global resolution will uh, reserve to C. And it will also tag, apply a reserved tag to the name so that local resolution will always fail. And so this will always reserve to an application of the global constant C exactly as we expected. Um, so, this has already existed in Lean3. So perhaps as a more uh, fancy 
example, I'm, I invite you to look at our session um, at the pre-LDI sponsors track uh, two weeks ago, where I, um, in the end, I demoed a slightly bigger example that introduces two DSS for writing a very simple web server so that you can say, for example, um, if I have a request to the URL slash create slash some name, then write out this response. And um, yeah, the, the whole example is a bit uh, bigger, but this shows again how um, general the syntax in the enforce and especially the binder structure. So here we're actually matching uh, part of the URL binding that to a new lean variable you can use in arbitrary contexts on the right hand side. So for a last example, um, I want to talk about tactics. Uh, lean free already had this ability to quote tactic blocks to make them reusable. So here, for example, we have a definition, make inch eek, um, yeah, that simply um, uh, executes a, a sequence of tactics. And we actually use that um, whenever an inductive type is defined to prove the objectivity of its constructors. Now, this was completely unhygienic in Lean Free. Um, no guarantees whatsoever, but I mean, it looks like this should be fine here because like, we're, we're accessing the constant name um, if, if, uh, dot intro, if and only if dot intro, and there will only be one uh, if dot intro in the context, right? Uh, that was true until Gabriel Ebner um, implemented a library for homotopy type theory in the free and of course defined his own if and only if dot intro inside this namespace. And then after that, when he tried to define an inductive type inside the same namespace, this tactic script from above did um, resolve to the wrong if and only if and the whole thing simply broke. Um, so at that point, inspired by the other issue spread I showed in the beginning, I immediately pointed out that, yeah, I mean, this, this is not um, uh, acceptable, right? Um, this is completely unhygienic, but I actually did not expect that we would, two years later, solve this with a single uh, unified system um, for a, a hygienic macro expansion. So that's exactly what we're doing in Lean4. A tactic block now is simply yet another kind of macro of the syntactic category tactic, and otherwise um, it is mostly the same. So tactic macros are a bit special that they're actually expanded on the fly by a new tactic interpreter, which also reduces compilation overhead. But otherwise, they are still a, uh, a macro. The semantics are the same. The hygiene guarantees are exactly the same as with any macros, uh, with other macros. And so the um, problem is immediately solved. Uh, we did realize that this also restricts not only global references, but also local ones. So for example, if you wrote a, a tactic macro that introduces a new hypothesis with a constant name H, then you would not be able to actually access that name H from outside the tactic block. And we're completely fine with that. Like this seems to be to us the, uh, exactly the desirable behavior for a well-behaved system. Um, and of course, if you really want to do something like this, you can always circumvent um, hygiene by using yet another um, hygiene bending function, such as this make ident in this case. So in summary, We've introduced a single unified system from notations over macros down to elaborators, which is based on a novel hygiene system that is both simple and non-invasive, but yeah, it does the job. Um, and finally, we have also introduced the first 
to the best of our knowledge tactic system that allows you to reuse arbitrary blocks of tactics but in a completely hygienic way. So if you're interested in any details on any parts um, uh, I showed today, then I hope you will enjoy our paper. And thank you for your attention. Okay. So if uh, there are questions for Sebastian, uh, let's see. You can raise a hand. Oh, so Enrico Tassi asks uh, on slide nine, what happens if tau is unknown? Right, so I think that was a, uh, the question is, um, if you use the lab command and bind the expected type, what happens if the expected type is not known? Um, so if you bind the expected type, it will actually um, insert new code, like when a lab is unfolding, code that will block the um, elaboration of this new syntax. Um, yeah, as, as long as the um, expected type remains unknown. So this is actually one of the new features we have in the Lean4 elaborator that parts like sub uh, subtrees of the syntax can say, I'm not ready yet to be elaborated. And then they will simply be postponed and tried again later. And of course, if, um, if we have some syntaxes that are, all of them are postponed and we can't continue further on, then we will generate an error eventually. Okay, very good. Are there, are there other questions for Sebastian? Um, I think there was one in the Slack, uh, oh, in the one. chat. Oh, uh, um, no, I, Enrico says thanks. Oh, in the chat? Yeah. Um, yeah, do you see it? That one's a bit longer. Okay, I'll, uh, it will take me a minute to read it. Okay, yeah, I should have read it out loud, um, but I think the gist of it is, is what is the story about reviewing theorems that make heavy use of notations? And yeah, this is certainly a problem already in, in existing IDPs and lean free, and that will only become um, perhaps more pressing in lean four if you use many, many macros. Um, but so, the general approach of Lean is anyway to completely rely on external type checkers for consistency, for any kind of consistency, syntactic or logical. And um, since we are uh, running arbitrary code um, inside the Lean server anyway, so um, yeah, we really should um, tell the, or you should be able to trust the external type checker to only insert um, let's say I, a reasonable amount of notations. And um, so probably the external type checker will not support arbitrary macros and I'd say it probably shouldn't. And so hopefully you will be able to trust that one even if you don't trust the full lean system itself. Okay, very good. Well, we're right on schedule. Let me check. I don't see any other questions. Enrico says thank you for answering his question. Um, but if there are no more, uh, that closes the session. So thank you, Sebastian, again. We're all, we're all applauding. <laughs>